Ever wondered why central banks print more money during a financial crisis? It's a question that has stumped many, bringing with it a sense of intrigue and curiosity. This world of finance and economy is truly a labyrinth, with every turn introducing a new concept, a new strategy. Today, we delve into one such strategy, a term you may have heard buzzing around financial circles, quantitative easing, or QE for short. Quantitative easing is a tool, a strategy employed by central banks when the financial weather gets a bit stormy. It's like a beacon of hope in times of financial distress, acting as a lifeboat for struggling economies. But what does it really mean? How does it work? And most importantly, why do central banks resort to it? These are some of the questions we aim to unravel in this exploration. So buckle up as we embark on this financial journey. Stay tuned to uncover the mystery of quantitative easing. Quantitative easing or QE sounds complex but it's quite simple when you break it down. Essentially it's a tool used by central banks to energize the economy, and it all starts with money. Not just any money but vast sums of it created out of thin air. You see, central banks have the unique ability to create money. They use this power to buy financial assets, usually government bonds, from commercial banks and other financial institutions. This process is what we call quantitative easing. But why the term quantitative? Well, quantitative refers to the large quantities of assets that are purchased, and easing refers to the aim of lowering the interest rates and increasing the money supply. Now, you might be wondering how does this all work? Let's break it down. When a central bank buys these assets, it's essentially injecting or easing money directly into the economy. By doing so, it increases the amount of money in circulation, effectively reducing interest rates. This makes borrowing cheaper for businesses and households, encouraging spending and investment. But here's the interesting part. The money that the central bank uses to buy these assets, it's not money they had lying around. It's newly created money added to the central bank's balance sheet. This might sound a bit like magic, but it's just how our modern monetary system works. The central bank can create new money at the click of a button and use it to buy assets, effectively increasing the money supply in the economy. Now it's important to remember that QE is not a cure-all solution. It's a tool, and like any tool, it must be used wisely. It can stimulate the economy in times of crisis, but it can also lead to inflation if not managed properly. So QE is essentially a central bank's method of pouring more money into the economy but why do they do it? Why would a central bank opt for quantitative easing? The answer lies in the economy's health. Imagine the economy as a great river, flowing with money instead of water. Just as rivers can run fast or slow, high or low, the economy too can flow at different speeds and depths. Sometimes, due to various factors, this river of money can slow down or even dry up a bit. This is what we call a period of slow economic growth or recession. In such situations the central bank, acting as the guardian of the river, opts for a tool known as quantitative easing, or QE for short. It's a bit like releasing a dam's floodgates to stimulate the flow of the river. By using QE, the central bank increases the supply of money in the economy, essentially pouring more water into our metaphorical river. But how is it done? The central bank does this by purchasing large quantities of financial assets like government bonds from banks and other financial institutions. This allows these institutions to have more money to lend to businesses and individuals, thereby stimulating economic activity. Now you might wonder, why not just lower the interest rates? Well, that's another aspect of QE. By buying these financial assets, the central bank effectively reduces the yield or the interest rate on those assets. This means that borrowing becomes cheaper, encouraging businesses and individuals to take out loans and spend more. The central bank's hope is that this increased spending will boost the economy, getting that river flowing smoothly once more. Of course QE is not a magic wand that can instantly fix all economic woes. It's a tool, and like all tools it needs to be used wisely and judiciously. But when used effectively, it can indeed give a much needed boost to an economy that's feeling a bit under the weather. In essence, QE is a boost to the economy when it's feeling a bit under the weather. Now that we know why QE is done, what does it do to our economy? Let's imagine the economy as a gigantic, intricate engine. Quantitative easing, or QE, is like the oil that keeps this engine running smoothly. One of the most immediate effects of QE is that it lowers borrowing costs. When a central bank buys up bonds, it increases their demand which drives down their yield or interest rate. This in turn, reduces the cost of borrowing for everyone, from governments and businesses to individuals like you and me. This lower cost of borrowing encourages spending. 
Businesses can borrow more money to invest in their operations, hire more people, or even start new projects. Individuals might decide to buy that house they've been eyeing, or maybe start a small business of their own. This increased spending can stimulate economic growth and reduce unemployment, both of which are key objectives for any central bank. Another potential benefit of QE is higher asset prices. When the yield on bonds falls, investors often look for higher returns elsewhere, such as in the stock market or real estate. This increased demand can drive up the prices of these assets, creating a wealth effect that can further stimulate spending. But QE isn't all sunshine and rainbows. It can also have some potentially negative effects. One of the biggest concerns is inflation. By increasing the money supply, QE can potentially devalue the currency, leading to higher prices for goods and services. This can erode purchasing power and make life more expensive for everyone. Another concern is that QE can create asset bubbles. When asset prices rise too fast, they can become detached from their underlying value, creating a bubble that could eventually burst, leading to severe economic repercussions. So, while QE can be a powerful tool for stimulating economic growth and reducing unemployment, it's not without its risks. Like any medicine, QE can have both beneficial effects and side effects. It's all theory until we see it in action, right? So let's dive into some real-world scenarios where quantitative easing has been put into play. First, let's talk about the United States, particularly during the financial crisis of 2008. The Federal Reserve, also known as the Fed, is the central banking system of the US. During the crisis, the Fed implemented quantitative easing to combat the economic downturn. They started buying long-term securities from the open market, primarily treasury notes and mortgage-backed securities. They did this to the tune of about $4.5 trillion, with the aim to lower long-term interest rates, encourage lending, and stimulate economic growth. It was a bold move, and while it wasn't without controversy, it played a significant part in stabilizing the US economy. Now let's hop over the pond to Europe. During the Eurozone crisis, the European Central Bank or ECB, also turned to quantitative easing. In 2015 the ECB announced a massive QE program, pledging to purchase 60 billion euros of assets per month until the inflation rate was close to 2%. This move was designed to inject money into the struggling economies of the Eurozone, lower borrowing costs, and stimulate economic activity. The ECB's actions offered a lifeline to countries like Greece and Spain, helping to stabilize the Eurozone economy. But it's not just in times of crisis that QE is used. The Bank of Japan, for instance, has been using QE for over two decades to fight deflation and stimulate economic activity. It's a strategy that has seen mixed results. But it's an example of how QE can be a long-term policy tool, not just a crisis response. In all these instances, we see that quantitative easing is more than just a theoretical concept. It's a real-world strategy employed by central banks to manage their economies. These examples show that QE is a powerful tool in a central bank's arsenal. So, we've journeyed through the world of quantitative easing today. It's a powerful tool in the arsenal of central banks, a method to stimulate the economy by increasing the money supply. It's a bit like an economic defibrillator used when other measures fail to kickstart growth. We delved into the reasons why it's done. In times of economic downturn, when interest rates are near zero and the economy is still sluggish, Quantitative easing can be the jolt needed to get things moving again. We explored its impact on the economy, from lowering borrowing costs and encouraging spending and investment, to the potential for inflation and devaluation of the currency. And we looked at real-world examples where quantitative easing has been deployed to combat recessions and financial crises. Each case is unique but the premise remains the same. The next time you hear about a central bank doing quantitative easing you'll know exactly what they're up to. Thanks for joining this economic adventure today. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and comment. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to keep up with the latest content.